everyone. We had some stiff competition tonight with the, the beautiful weather, so we're very happy to see such a great turnout. My name is Shelley Gray, and I'm a professor at the School of Pharmacy and the director for the Pine Center in Geriatric Pharmacy. On behalf of the Pine Center and the School of Pharmacy, we'd like to welcome you to this event. This is our second annual, in case you missed it, update, and we're very pleased to have you out here today. So let me know if this has happened to any of you. Uh, you're sitting um, after uh, a long day, enjoying the news, and all of a sudden you see a, a headline about a medication that you're taking and some new serious adverse event that it causes. And so at this point you're thinking, wow, like what do I do? Do I call my provider? Do I just stop taking it? Um, and we're often left with a big quandary about what to do about these major headlines. So this is exactly what we're going to be discussing tonight. We have, we have selected three topics that are hot off the press over the past year, and we hope to provide you with information for how you can make decisions for yourself or for um, the patients that you provide care to. We are very grateful to the advancement team of the School of Pharmacy with, and the University of Washington Alumni Association. A special thanks to Danielle Schubach and Rachel Firebaugh, who led the planning of tonight's program. So, so I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, telling you a little bit about the Pine Center for Geriatric Pharmacy. In 2016, the Pine Center was established with a generous gift from Drs. Joy and Elmer Pine. And we are very grateful um, for this generous gift and very pleased that Dr. Joy Klein was able to be with us this evening. So thank you, Joy. <laughs> so the Klein Center has three huge goals. We only are striving to be global leaders um, in geriatric pharmacy education, research, and community outreach. So I just wanted to give you a little sneak preview of what we've been up to over the past year. Um, with regard to research, our major goal is to improve medication use and safety in older adults through um, our new research endeavors. And we, the Pine Center faculty do research in a wide range of areas, but I want to focus on two important areas that have received a lot of attention over the past year. And so we all know that falling is a significant problem for older adults, and that one in four of older adults fall each year, and some of these falls result in serious consequences, serious injury. Um, and so one of our um, um, important achievements this year is we received a large grant from the Center for Disease Control um, to study ways to reduce risky medications in older adults with the goal to prevent falling. So stay tuned. Um, we're just in the initial phases of this project and hope to be back here someday um, to give you the results of that, that research. So another important area that we focus on in the Pine Center is in the area of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And it's quite shocking. Um, every 65 seconds, uh, a person develops uh, Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. So every 65 seconds. This is only going to continue to be a huge public health issue with the aging of the population. And um, again, the Pine Center has a, a significant focus in this area. Um, so some faculty have received a, a large grant to study the costs associated to providing care to older adults with dementia. Um, we, um, faculty received another study to look at the relationship between epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease to see if there are any links between these two conditions. And then lastly, if, for those of you that were here last year at this event, um, we presented some work about proton pump inhibitors and dementia risk. And we, we found that it did not increase, these medications do not increase dementia risk. 
but um, this research was recognized um, nationally, and we received an award for, for this paper. So that was some you know, exciting news I wanted to share. And so a few pride points about our education and outreach endeavors. Uh, since 1985, we have um, 400 students that have graduated with the applying certificate in geriatric pharmacy. And these students are prepared to provide care to medically complex older adults. And we have some of our certificate students in the audience tonight. So we're pleased to see you here. Um, we also take great pride in terms of trying to get students interested in, in doing research um, regard the, with regard to older adults. And we have awarded um, over $108,000 to 30 students to work on various projects related to aging. And then lastly, many of our pharmacy students go out into the community and provide um, uh, educational events and outreach events such as health fairs to older adults. And so again, we're trying to serve our communities and make our communities a better place. So lastly, just coincidentally, we selected May for our In Case You Missed It public lecture last year. Um, and then we discovered after the fact that it's actually Older Americans Month. Um, so this year's theme is Connect, Create, and Contribute, which I think um, we all hope to age in that way. So a few disclaimers. The content that will be presented tonight is really just for educational purposes and that any decisions about your health care or medication changes should be made with a, a health care provider. So we don't want you to go out and change your medications based on, on these presentations, but we hope this might facilitate a discussion with your health care provider. So I will stop talking now. Um, I wanted to introduce our three speakers. Um, just a little, um, again, uh, the format for tonight is each speaker will be talking for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have some time after each talk for questions. And then, um, so you know, this might take an hour, hour, 15 minutes. We're kind of just gauging uh, in terms of how many questions that you have. And then following that, we will be having a reception in the lobby. So, um, I first would like to present, our first speaker will be um, Dr. Carano, and she will be presenting on cannabis use in older adults, seeing through the haze. Our second speaker is Dr. Rachel Fireball, and her presentation title is Aspirin Use in Older Adults, Ounce of Prevention or a Bitter Pill. And then our last speaker is Dr. Leanne Mike, and the title of her presentation is Vitamin D Use in Older Adults, A Fall from Grace. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ferrara. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am just going to jump right in in the interest of time and keep in mind that there is a lot of information on this topic. So if I don't get to the question that you have, I'm sticking around afterwards at the reception too to answer any further questions. Okay. Um, so let's see. There we go. Uh, so I like to start with a little bit of history. Um, which is actually kind of interesting on the subject of cannabis. Um, if you, you know, the, the original roots are kind of uh, debatable, but National Geographic um, has claimed that it was found in these Neolithic fire pits like four to 5,000 years ago. Uh, and there's also um, some evidence of a Chinese emperor mentioning it sometime around 2700 BC. Um, but I think you know where, where it kind of enters into our written record is it was brought to the attention of Western medicine by W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who was a surgeon in the 1840s with the British East Indian Trading Company. Um, and they were using it as an analgesic, an anti-inflammatory, antispasmodic, and for its anti-convulsive properties. So some of the, the echoes of the use it for today as well, right? Or people claim to be using it for today. Um, 
Also, kind of a, the darker history behind that is um, it was also rumored to be used to pacify the slaves during that time as well. Um, there was a French psychiatrist who used it um, for headaches, increasing appetite, aiding sleep, um, and it was added to the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1850 and then removed in the 1940s, um, but it was being prescribed for labor pain, nausea, and rheumatism. Okay, a little further history bringing us to today. So it was criminalized in 1914, 1937, and 1951. <laughs> the Schedule One designation um, was official in 1970, right? Because that designates it as something with no medical user value and high addiction potential. Um, and then in 1996, California became the first state to re-legalize its use, specifically for patients with AIDS, cancer, and other serious illness. We were not far behind, and Washington passed I-692 for medical use. Um, and then in 2012, we again um, passed a new law for recreational use, and that was I-502. Um, and then, uh, bringing us a little closer to, to today, in 2015, they developed the Washington Cannabis Patient Protection Act, and that's SB 5052. The reason for this is because they legalized it for recreational, and they had already legalized it for medical. So how do you then merge the two systems into something a little less chaotic than what was going on out in the community? Um, bonus for anyone who can recognize this local celebrity who has been an ardent supporter of I-502 legalization. That's right, Rick Steves. <laughs> so, <laughs> so where is marijuana or cannabis legal today? And I got this off of the Business Insider, but it is basically up to date. So it is legal in um, 10 states for medical use, right? And I believe the most recent one was Michigan, uh, just this past cycle. And it's um, legal for medical use in now 33 states. And in this past uh, election cycle, I believe Oklahoma, Missouri, and Utah were the latest ones to legalize it for medical use. Surprising, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and there are actually countries that have legalized it, one of which is our neighbors to the north, who happen to be the second country to legalize it. Do you guys know what the first country to legalize it was? Uruguay. using this stuff and no spoiler alert here but yes of course right um, I became interested when one of my patients came up to me and said you know doctor you've been trying to help me with my arthritis pain for years you've been prescribing me all this crap um, and, <laughs> what he used. And, um, and he said you know I, I want to try pot I'm gonna try weed and he's like I'm 82, I've lived a good life, <laughs> you know, I've never done anything outside of the lines. And he went to his grandson because he had, <laughs> he had tried obtaining it from some teenagers that he knew, and he said, they, they wouldn't give me any, and they ran away, and I think they were worried that I was a cop. Um, <laughs> Some from his grandson, and he said, This has been made a world of difference to me, and it's been better than anything you have ever prescribed for me. So I lost a little trust. <laughs> um, but he uh, he opened my eyes to, you know, is there should should we be talking about this? And should we be talking about it more than just like, no, sorry, I can't help you, right? Okay. So from 2006 to 2013, the prevalence of past year cannabis use among adults 65 or older had a relative increase of A, 50%, B, 100, C, 150, D, 200, or E, 250%. You got 
You guys are smart cookies. <laughs> so absolutely, 250% are our older adults are the fastest growing users of, of cannabis products. So why are people turning to cannabis? Like my patient, we have trouble treating arthritis. That's one of the hardest things to treat, and now with the opioid epidemic, a lot of the medications that we have traditionally used to treat aches and pains are are bad for you, um, and we are being discouraged, obviously, from prescribing things with addictive potential. Um, we have a lot of conditions that are difficult to treat that, um, that have medications with significant side effects that our patients don't like, including um, PTSD and anxiety, depression. And hey, it's over the counter and it's legal now, right? Great stuff. If you are one of our baby boomers, maybe you tried it before, right? And it worked then, so why not give it a go now? It's natural, therefore it must be safe. It's not addictive like opioids. The kids gave it to them to try, right? Like my patient. And marketing, marketing, it's a business, right? Similar to the supplement industry, it's, it's a business. And older adults have remarkable, uh, you know, incomes that are disposable that they can spend on um, cannabis products. So there are a lot of articles that have been coming out about how adult family or um, how cannabis stores have been literally busing seniors into their dispensaries for these field trips. And if you read some of these articles, they're really fun. I mean, these, these folks are excited. It's, it's, you know, it's a fun field trip. Um, and it, it gets them out, and you have these like, lovely young people who are telling them that you know, this can maybe help them with some of their aches and pains and to try it. I think that's all well and good, but I think one of the really important parts of today is that we be the ones also involved in this conversation, right? Because it's great that the cute young bud tender is, you know, telling you what's going to help you, um, but what if they don't tell you about the risks? What if they don't know about particular risks that can affect you? So. I'm going to give you a little bit of the terminology so that if you do go out and visit a dispensary, you know the lingo. Uh, so cannabis sativa L is the actual scientific name of the plant, um, but there's three bioactive compounds um, found in the cannabis uh, family. So there's the terpenes or the terpenoids, and these are aromatic chemicals similar to those found in other plants, like if you think about essential oils, pine, citrus, and then there's the flavonoids, which are common plant chemicals like in green tea that would have to have some anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. And then there's the phytocannabinoids. I, I added phyto in there because we also have endocannabinoids, which are um, ones that we find in our own human systems. Um, but cannabinoids are the, the things that have that unique chemical structure that are found in the highest concentration of the female part of the plant. Um, and why do I mention these? Well, because a lot of the um, cannabis products that are produced by pharmaceutical companies are very pure, so they don't have the flavonoids and they don't have the terpenes. And if you go to one of the dispensaries, a lot of times you'll hear the term entourage effect. Um, folks at the dispensaries have done a lot of their own research and are passionate. This is their hobby, this is what they enjoy doing, and so they have a lot of the research um, and uh, have studied um, the, at least the lay literature that's been out. And so one of the things they talk about is this entourage effect, and so if you are only using the pharmaceutical products that are very pure, you're missing out on possible um, extra uh, action from things like the terpenes and flavonoids that are con um, contained within the cannabis products. And then the bud tender is like a bartender, but for cannabis, and they're the ones who are um, giving you the information and selling the products at the store. So there are over 100 known cannabinoids that have been isolated so far. THC 
THC is the most psychoactive, right? That's the one that they test for in drug tests. Uh, CBD is the non-psychoactive, psychoactive, we call it more somatic acting um, constituent, and it has low affinity for the endogenous cannabinoid receptors, and it's thought to modulate the action of THC, again, sort of like this entourage effect. Um, but it hasn't been studied as much as the THC, right? Because we're more worried about the THC, that's the psychoactive one, and that's the one that gives people the high. So what are, what are the, um, the cannabis products acting on when we take them? Well, they're acting on two main receptors that have been identified that we know are CB1 and CB2. And you can see that they were only recently relatively recently identified, right, in 1988 and 1993. Uh, interestingly, CB1 um, blocked rats, or rat babies, don't, uh, don't feed and then end up dying from malnutrition. Um, and these uh, endocannabinoids, uh, anandamide and the 2-AG, are what bind to the two cannabinoid receptors. So they're expressed in high concentrations in breast milk, which may account for the rats, and have a role, in, may have a role in runner's high. So I did want to just point out a little bit of the pharmacology, which the pharmacists probably know way better than I do. Um, but the important thing that I wanted to point out is that you can see that things that you take by mouth, orals, the edibles, um, tinctures, they even have sprays, they have something, you know, any way you can put it in your body or put it on your body, they have, they have a product for you. Um, but the orals and things that you eat or ingest, the time to effect is anywhere from half an hour to four hours, and the duration lasts about six to eight hours, so almost a full day. If you inhale something through combustion or vaporization, the time to effect is within minutes. So compare that to 30 minutes to four hours. Um, it's it's more, much more instantaneous. And then the duration is less as well, to, uh, to a few hours. Um, topical or transdermal, we don't really have a whole lot of information on. Um, and rectal or vaginal, um, we definitely don't have any information on for you there, right? Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because the, the time that people tend to get in trouble is they eat a gummy bear with some um, edible tincture cannabinoid in it, and um, they're like, God, this, this isn't working. And maybe they were one of those baby boomers who um, used to smoke pot in the good old days, and they're like, well, why isn't this doing anything? And then they go and they eat another gummy bear and another gummy bear, right? Because who only eats one gummy bear? <laughs> or has a cookie? And then they get in trouble. So it's extensively metabolized in the liver, um, fecal excretion more than through your urine, uh, and it's cleared. Uh, it's clear it's in the change of renal disease. I'm going to just skip ahead um, just in the interest of time. There's many drug interactions that I think are important to know about, which is why it's important to discuss with your doctor. And the other issues with the quote natural product is that it is grown, it's a plant, right? So you just have to be aware that there are some things that can come along with it, including herbicides, pesticides, mold, fungus. Um, and because it's a plant, the consistency of the products and particularly the concentration in products is a little harder to regulate or monitor, even for the companies, but the good companies who are making some of these products will actually self-test um, and your bud tender can help you figure out which companies those are. Interestingly enough, there was also a study done to see um, whether or not the labels on the products, because by Washington state law, they are supposed to be labeled with the concentration of THC to CBD. And um, they found that in Los Angeles, products tend to be um, under-labeled, which means that they were getting more potent products <laughs> But in Seattle, we tend to overlabel our products, so you tend to get not as potent products as the label is telling you. Okay. Um, so anytime you go to a dispensary, you can hear all about the wonderful benefits 
Um, so I'm here to just remind you that there are some things, there are some side effects to cannabis that we want people to be aware of. Um, and you've maybe read about the um, New York Times reporter who <laughs> tried out some edibles and took too much, which happens more frequently than people would like. And she ended up in the uh, emergency room with uh, increased heart rate, tachycardia, feeling like she might die. Um, but really, um, just palpitations, just not feeling well. So that can definitely happen. Um, it can be associated with some increase in cough, sputum production, wheezing. So if you have already uh, pulmonary disease or lung disease, that might be something to consider. Um, but there's really not uh, good evidence for association with any forms of cancer, but the strength of the evidence was not great. Um, as you can imagine, it's a hard thing to study. A lot of the data is going to be collected via survey um, because this is not, you know, we're not able to do triple studies with that. So in Washington State, we do not prescribe cannabis. We can authorize it on special tamper-proof paper. Um, if you go see the Veterans Association, they can't do that for you, but we can all talk about it, absolutely, right? So why is authorization something that's reasonable to get when really you can just walk into any dispensary as long as you're 21 and older and get some? Well, you can purchase more and you can possess more than people who don't have the authorization. You can purchase products with more THC. It's tax-free. You can grow it at home and there's extra protection from prosecution or arrest. Here is a list of the qualifying conditions for people who can offer the providers if they want to authorize cannabis use for you. Um, and you can see it's quite an extensive list. This list, it should be noted, was put together by, um, by people out in the community. So it's people who have been using it for these conditions already. It was not put together by um, medical, medical folks. Um, so, Keep in mind that cannabis kind of lives at the cross section of medicine and politics, right? Okay. So I have some advice for any providers in the room. Think of cannabis as a supplement. It's similarly unregulated. Uh, it has some unknown side effects, some known, um, and you don't know what might be in it. Please visit a dispensary. I did. I was very excited, right? I grew up as like a, an Asian woman raised by a tiger mom, and so it was all very exciting when I walked into the dispensary. Um, this, is, this is me with the bug tender. Um, it's a business box. So when I asked to take a picture of their um, of their store the counter with the products behind it, they were they said we prefer you not to because other stores might steal our idea of having it was very medical. So the um, the bartenders were in you know scrubs and had a uniform. Um, and yeah. And they had the products organized by um, root, so orals, sprays. Um, and they had them very well and nicely organized and it was very, very clinical and they did not want kind of that model um, that they have that has been very successful for this store being disseminated. Okay, so um, please, if you're going to go visit, um, try to visit a dispensary that has been endorsed by the Washington State Department of Health. It doesn't mean it's been endorsed by medical staff or doctors. It just means that they have people who are there who've had a little extra training about how to advise you on basically keeping your cannabis from um, getting into the wrong hands is the main thing, the main part of the training. You only have to be 18 or older to um, do the training, and the main part of it is like, please lock up your cannabis so that other people don't get into it, particularly your grandchildren, right, or kids. Um, and so that's, some, that's similar to some of the advice I have at the very end. Um, however, I'm just going to quickly go through this um, so that I can give other folks some time. But um, again, I recommend that, that you guys go to a dispensary um, endorsed by Washington State Department of Health. They just have that small little extra level of training. 
Um, do not buy products from the internet on the street or synthetic products from gas station stores. Those have actually, there's a number of case studies out there of people getting seriously harmed from things because it has a lot of extra things in there that are frankly dangerous for people. Um, you can get it off the internet. I shouldn't say don't get it off the internet, right? Because once you have a product that you feel like it works well in you and it, you've tested it out on yourself and it's safe, um, chances are you can probably find it on the internet um, if you go to a reputable site. Uh, same approach to medications, start low, go slow. Um, try half the dose, quarter of the dose, start there. Uh, there has been research done on cannabis. Some of it is very promising particularly in seizures in children, pain and nausea and vomiting. And then of course, more recently, um, in the setting of the opioid use disorder crisis uh, and epidemic, um, perhaps uh, helping with, with getting people unaddicted to those things as well, or lessening their use. Uh, we do recommend topical or transdermal products over oral products just due to the potential systemic effects of oral products, um, whereas the topical or transdermal products might have less interactions with any medications people might be taking and the side effects might be less. Um, and then we, we do recommend products with more CBD than THC as far as concentration or CBD alone is also something we remember very, um, way back a couple slides ago that CBD doesn't um, bind as much to the endocannabinoid receptors that we have. Try a new product on the day you're not going to drive, go out or make important decisions. <laughs> have someone with you nearby just in case of adverse effects, particularly if you're going to take something oral, right? Maybe not as big a deal if you're going to rub something topical on, but definitely something oral. And then, unfortunately, cannabis products aren't tested, regulated, or quality controlled by some government body. Um, some products have undergone testing, so please ask your bud tenders, your medical marijuana consultant um, at the dispensary which products have undergone extra testing. And be aware that these products are expensive. Only cash is accepted. And so most places have ATMs inside, but imagine if you're going up to one of those places and you are retarded because they know you might have cash with you and when you're leaving it, they know you might have product on you. So please go with friends during the day. Um, it's not legal in all states, so if you find a product that works for you and you're going out of state, just keep in mind that um, it's, it's not legal in all 50 states. Um, and so, uh, the authorization only works within Washington State. Um, I can answer more questions about that if you're worried what TSA might do to you. And don't forget that it does remain a controlled substance. If you work, please review your job's policy on drug testing. Uh, if you have a product high in THC, that's what they're testing for. If you are using a CBD-only product, that's fine. Um, and then lock it up, especially if you have grandchildren who visit or live with you. Kids are curious. Okay. I'm going to end with Willie Nelson, who, by the way, is 85, and he thinks the biggest killer on the planet is stress. And I still think the best medicine is and always has been cannabis. So endorsed by Willie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> and we got through that part, so thank you very much for listening. I wanted to thank um, Zach Markham, Carol Popper, and Sarah, too, who helped, um, or who, who wrote leave this letter to the editor um, and included me, but it's marijuana use in older adults employing a risk reduction strategy, which um, includes a lot of the advice that I mentioned today. And obviously I'd like to thank the Klein Center, thank you, and the School of Pharmacy for inviting me. I'll be around for questions, um, so please come up to me afterwards. We have time for a couple questions. Any questions, just raise your hand. <laughs> I just wonder if you could tell us which story you tried out. Sure, so um, the one that I went to, I live on the east side, so I went to this store that I found an ad for called The Medical Tree. So, uh, so I'm, I'm also a palliative care provider, and a lot of our patients, right, cancer, end of life, we're using cannabis, and we used to have a good um, medical 
cannabis dispensary that we went to, and that has since closed down since um, recreational became legal and they merged the two, and we really have not been able to find a really good quality dispensary to then refer our patients to. So I've been trying to check out ones that maybe err more towards the side of you know, thoughtful, medical, you know, focused advice. Um, so I did go to one called the Medical Tree, and it's fascinating because they, the reason why they didn't want me taking pictures is because one side had their model, which is really amazing, is one side was the um, recreational use, and it was connected via that hallway to the medical side. Um, and the medical side, the, so the recreational side was like party, loud music, totally <laughs> fun, crazy, you know, young folks dressed um, very fashionably. And the medical side was again people in scrubs in uniforms with these beautiful glass counters and a lot of product, very tastefully displayed, and it looked like a pharmacy. So um, that's why they didn't want me taking pictures because they're worried that somebody will steal the model. Uh, and clearly it was a very successful model. However, when I started asking them about products for elderly patients or people with dementia, say, or people on various medications, like they weren't, they weren't able to really answer some of those questions. And furthermore, what they were pushing on me was the tinctures and was more of the oral products. For some, for, you know, I, I asked about you know, if I have a patient with XYZ, right? Um, because they're more expensive. So just to give you an idea, I did bring something that I bought from them. <laughs> this, is, um, it, this is a topical, uh, and it's supposed to have the concentration, but it does not. But it does say 150 milligrams THC plus CBD. It's supposed to be more CBD in here. Um, so you keep in mind, CBD is also cheaper than the THC to produce. Um, and you can see it smells really nice. It has like all kinds of organic goodies like avocado oil, coconut oil, shea butter, vitamin E, um, along with um, along with the THC and CBD, uh, forty-five dollars. The tinctures of this size. So first of all, they don't sell tinctures in things this big. Um, the tinctures um, are in like sixty to eighty dollars for like something like this. So. They're, it's a business, right? And so, um, do they mean well? Yes. Do they have a lot of knowledge? Absolutely. But they're still a business, so keep that in mind. Um, and the person I talked to was absolutely lovely, but it, it still is something that you need to keep in back of your mind. Great. Um, Dr. Hirano is going to be around, like she said, for more questions at the end, but we do need to move on. So please join me in thanking her one more time. Hi, I'm Rachel Firebaugh. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I just wanted to say I think it's such a special evening, um, not only because we're heading into a holiday weekend, but because each of you here has the potential uh, to empower somebody else in terms of their health uh, and their medication. So I'm excited for what can come out of tonight, not only for the people that are here, but for our community as a whole. So my topic uh, this evening is aspirin use in older adults, an ounce of pre prevention or a bitter pill. So I'd like to jump right in uh, as we don't have a lot of time, so I'll um, cut to the chase and get right into the content. So a few things that I'd like to cover with you tonight are to consider your health lens to get started. Uh, what's all the buzz that we've been hearing about uh, aspirin? It's really been everywhere in the news. And then thinking a little bit about the history and how aspirin has been used. And then what's the big change? And then I think the most important thing that most of us hope to, to take home is, you know, what do we do with this information next? So I love this quote from Brene Brown. And if you're not familiar with her, she's a research professor in the University of Houston Graduate School of, uh, or Graduate College of Social Work 
Um, she's most recently come out with a book, um, Dare to Lead, and also you might have heard of Daring Greatly. And she says, learning is not comfortable. It's change. It's push, pushing against old ideas. It's challenging. And so I think how this relates tonight is that for all of us, whether we're patients, whether we're healthcare providers, um, community members, whatever our role is, we're constantly hearing new information, and that can be challenging. And I just want to say that tonight, if you hear something that's a little bit uncomfortable, that's okay. And that's all part of the learning curve is sometimes taking a little bit of time to digest it, um, because that really truly is part of, of learning. So I'd like to take a minute right before we get into more of the key content to reflect. Um, and actually the picture that you see on the screen is a picture of my grandfather, Dr. Christian uh, Peter Hall. And actually that's me um, as a little girl. Uh, I know if you can, you can see the connection, but I wanted to start with this um, because it really relates to what I'm talking about in terms of our health lens. So as I started to look into the information about aspirin, I found that I was having some resistance, you know, to this information. Even though the studies were great, I wondered, you know, where was this coming from? And so I started to reflect and think back and realize that when I was a little girl, I re remembered my grandfather, who was a doctor in the small town of Ashland, Oregon. Um, he actually, I remember him saying that aspirin really should be for everyone. I remember him talking with my mom. So it really goes back to that experience as a child um, and so I had to sort of think about that and, and kind of work through that to be open to the new information. And I bring that up because I think for many of us, whether it's about aspirin or other issues related to our health or medications, we all have stories and experiences that impact how we're able to take in information. So um, I say that today just as you're thinking about the topics that come out uh, tonight, to sort of think about, do you have any of those coming into play for you? And, um, we don't have a lot of time just to stop and reflect here, but I hope maybe um, tonight or in the coming days or weeks that you might take a chance to reflect and think about what this might be for you. So now diving into the content, and I'll circle back to that a little bit later and how that relates to, uh, to aspirin. So these are some of the big headlines we've been hearing. I mean, you've probably seen um, some of these in the last couple of weeks. I was just sent a new article by a colleague um, just in the past week, so this is a super timely topic. Um, and as um, Dr. Gray noted in her introduction, I'm sure there's been some scary feelings for many of us, knowing that um, many people take aspirin, and so you're seeing on this on the news and going, gosh, you know, what do I do with this information? What is the next step? So a little bit about in terms of the history and how aspirin has been used. I think you know most of us know that aspirin has been a lot around for a long, long time. Um, even going back to ancient times, um, Egyptians used willow bark for medicinal purposes for pain. And today we still use aspirin for pain, um, inflammation, and mostly for uh, prevention of cardiovascular events or um, heart-related prevention. And so that's really our topic here today is thinking about, you know, how does aspirin fit in to the topic of heart protection? So I think this is the moment that we're waiting for is what is the big change? You know, what's the big take home message? And so recently and very timely um, with this talk tonight, um, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association 2019 guidelines came out. And the big recommendation is that for most people um, without a history of heart disease should not take aspirin to prevent a heart attack or stroke. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit deeper. And this is a big change um, from before when really um, you probably had heard, you know, an, an aspirin a day keeps the doctor away. So it was really broadly recommended. So now taking it back to you, if you're sitting in the audience going, you know, so should I take a daily aspirin for heart protection? Or you're thinking of your husband or wife or someone that you know. And the key message is it depends. And I wish I could give you a very a straightforward answer, but it really isn't black and white. And there are some things that we need to think through. So I think the big take home message too is you need to talk to your provider before taking any steps. But I am gonna give you more information and empower you with some things to take to your doctor. 
So I want us all to be on the same page in terms of uh, some key terms. So just to be aware, you might hear, hear the term ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And really, um, this is just another word for thinking about a heart attack or a stroke, a heart-related event. Um, also, to sort of understand my next couple of slides, it's important to understand the words both primary and secondary prevention. And so just in very simple terms, when we think about primary prevention, this is really preventing that first event. So if you've never had a heart attack or stroke, working to prevent that. And then when we think about secondary prevention, this is if we've already identified that you have some sort of heart disease and preventing that next event or progression of your disease. So here are the, the big bits of information that's new and exciting, um, or maybe exciting is the wrong word, but really groundbreaking. So in general, low-dose aspirin is no longer routinely uh, recommended for primary prevention. So again, for that first prevention of that first event. So, and especially um, in patients over 70, we know that the risk exceeds the benefit, and ex especially due to bleeding risk. And also, in general, we're not recommending it for anyone who has um, any increased risk of bleeding because we know that aspirin does cause bleeding. So there are some people where we still may recommend aspirin, and the guidelines did leave some room for that conversation with your provider. So in patients that are more middle-aged, there still may, may be a possibility when you're at high cardiovascular risk, but not at an increased risk for bleeding. And again, this is for primary prevention, prevention of that first event. So there is a space where um, we may not say, uh, rule it out for everyone. So this is where I want to have us pause for just a minute, and I want to be really clear um, that secondary for secondary prevention, aspirin is still very much recommended and very much potentially life-saving. So again, for secondary prevention, we're saying that we've already identified that you have some cardiovascular disease and we want to prevent a future event. So in this case, we know that the cardiovascular benefit clearly outweighs the risk. So I wanted to differentiate here that you know, there's a difference between secondary and primary prevention in terms of what this big new uh, news is from the guideline. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but I think it's interesting to know um, that in the last year we've had some major trials come out about aspirin. This is what's generated a lot of the news. So in 2018 we had three different big trials, a three arrive and ascend, and these were all big trials of more than 10,000 people that compared 100 milligrams of aspirin to placebo. Um, and they were in three different groups. So one was healthy, older adults, one was individuals with moderate uh, risk of heart disease, and the third group was those with, uh, with diabetes. And basically on the whole, the studies found that aspirin was not beneficial and that uh, the bleeding risk was more worrisome, except for in the case of the diabetic patients. There was some uh, risk reduction or some benefits uh, for cardiovascular, uh, excuse me, some benefit uh, for your cardiovascular health. However, the benefits were sort of a wash given the bleeding risk. So all in all, um, these were not good trials in terms of, I mean, they were great trials, but in terms of supporting aspirin for primary prevention, um, this didn't support that um, continuing on the whole. So I think what Dr. Roger Blumenthal says here is a great summary, and he's the co-chair of the ACC AHA Guideline Committee. So he's the co-chair of the committee that actually came up with these guidelines. And he said, clinicians should be very selective in prescribing aspirin for people without known cardiovascular disease. It's more important to opt optimize lifestyle habits and control uh, blood pressure and cholesterol. So I think that really summarizes the big take home point. So in terms of uh, optimizing our lifestyle habits, I think we all know about these, you know, eat healthier, eat, eat vegetables, um, exercise, keep a healthy weight, avoid tobacco. One thing that I wanted to draw our attention to on this slide, I don't think this is new, new information for most of us, is to 
to exercise more. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we have to do vigorous exercise or be you know, running marathons, but just moving more. Um, we know that for the, uh, the average American, that we sit for more than seven hours a day. So even getting up, you know, walking down to a meal, parking a little bit further away, um, just the simple things really can make a big difference. So just taking yourself from sedentary ways to more movement. And then we want to optimize our medications for heart protection. And I just want to uh, put in a plug for pharmacists at this point. We would love to talk with you about your medications. And more and more, there's great opportunities um, for us to sit down with you. And we, there's a new service that we pr provide. It's actually not new, but it's um, become more popular, is medication therapy management. So we can sit down with you, go over your medications, and help this be a, a less overwhelming process. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay, so now what? What do we do with this information? There's been some big changes, so what do we practically do next? So the first thing that I want to emphasize is let's not stop, start, or change our aspirin therapy until we talk to our care time, until we talk to our care team. I really believe that, in, that to be healthy starts with you feeling empowered. So I want to, in the next slide, go over some key tips in order to help you do this. So one of the key things um, to having a great conversation with your care team or your provider is to bring your medication list and to keep that up to date. I know that seems really straightforward, um, but it's often forgotten the supplements that we're taking, the over-the-counter products, and still, even if you go to um, a doctor where they have an electronic health record, you may be visiting a dentist or a physical therapist um, who has a different system, and at this point, all the systems don't talk to each other. So really, you as the patient are the common denominator. So to be empowered in your care, really keep that medication current and keep it with you when you go to your medical visits. Um, also, come prepared with questions. These visits go quickly. We know they're often short. So, I advise you, you know, if you're going in to talk about aspirin, jot a couple questions down. Maybe something to ask your provider is, I'm on aspirin right now. What might be the pros and cons or the benefits and risks if I continue? So that might be a place to start. Um, also, bring a family member, caregiver, or possibly a friend with you. I mean, at any age, I think no matter where you're at in life, it's nice to have an extra set of eyes and ears in those visits when there's lots of new information coming at you. And then I want to tie it back to what I said at the beginning in terms of keeping in mind your health lens. So as you go into that visit, um, keep in mind maybe those experiences from the past and um, think about whether they're um, causing you to not be open to future ideas, but also at the same time, advocate for what you want. So it's sort of a, a balance between the two. Keep in mind that you might be having some resistance, but at the same time, please do advocate for what your needs are. I think for all of us who are healthcare providers in the room, you know, we want to honor your needs and preferences. So just know that when you come in, that we want to keep your best interests in mind. And at the same time, we want you to know the most current evidence as well. So I want to leave you with uh, this thought from Melinda Gates, who's the co-chair of the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And she just came out with a new book, and it's called The Moment of Lift. Um, and if you get a chance to read it, I found it really inspiring. And one of the things that she says in her books, and it's, I think it makes a lot of sense, is that when we lift others up, they lift us up too. So I hope tonight you can leave feeling not only that you're empowered to do something for your own care, but maybe you start with something simple. Maybe you offer to go to a medical visit with someone else to be an, an extra set of eyes and ears. Um, maybe you invite someone on a walk, knowing that maybe they need to work on uh, better protecting their heart. Or maybe you just lend a listening ear to someone else to let them um, talk about some of their feelings around health. Because as much as we, the clinical information is important, some of these emotional attachments that we have for, and the reasons that we do things are much bigger than any of the clinical piece. Um, and I just wanted to say that I think this is this also means so much. I was looking at this space tonight, and actually this building was um, was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it was a very generous gift. And then I also think about Dr. Joy and Elmer Klein, and and just how that when that generosity starts 
we're all lifted up and it's part of building a healthier community. So thank you for being here tonight and thank you for being a step towards a healthier community. Thank you. What questions do you have? I think we have time for one question and Dr. Fireball will stick around as well. In the back. I can hear you. Uh, I just wondered, uh, what are the what are some typical conditions that would put somebody at risk of bleeding independent of aspirin? Right, that's a good question. So I want to mention that when you do go and talk to your care team, there are some different calculators and um, tools that we can use to help um, figure out what your bleeding risk might be, but a history of having a bleed would definitely put you at risk of a future bleed. Um, medications such as other anticoagulants like warfarin um, or if you're on any other medications that have bleeding risk. So those are a, to name a few, but there are some systematic ways when you come in to talk to your care team that we can help figure out what that looks like for you as you consider the risks and benefits of maybe possibly thinking about aspirin. I hope that helps, but feel free to come talk to me afterwards. Great question. All right, please join me one more time in thanking Dr. Fireball. And last but not least, we have Dr. Leanne Mike talking about vitamin D. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm reflecting on what Dr. Fireball just shared, and that she was reminding us not to be so sedentary. And so in the spirit of not keeping you in your seats too long, I will try to um, condense my material into something a little bit shorter so that we can get out, get up and move, and maybe go get a tiny, tiny bit of vitamin D from the sun if it's still out. So that's my goal. <laughs> Um, so the, the general outline for tonight is to talk a little bit about vitamin D. So I, I too have a little bit of history. Um, we'll tie that to falling. And then we'll talk about some of the more recent, kind of in case you missed it stuff. And we'll dive a little bit into the literature, but promise not too deep, not too deep, just enough. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some general comments, which, spoiler alert, they're not going to be much different than what you heard from the prior two speakers. Okay, so I think everybody would be familiar with, with um, the vitamin D and, and, and making its association with rickets. Um, this is a photograph taken of a young woman in the early 1900s. Um, you'll notice that her um, legs have the bowed appearance of rickets from vitamin D deficiency. And this was first recognized, well, it may have been recognized more, but in our written history, it was more often recognized in Victorian England as a, the byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, when people were moving from working on farms out of doors to working in factories with under poor conditions, not well lighted, not natural sunlight, and pretty rough um, <coughs> me, working conditions. So there was um, uh, sort of an epidemic of rickets. And as I was preparing my research for this, I ran across a study from 1922, and it came out of Vienna, and shout out to women scientists out there. It was a, it was a study that was conducted, an observational study conducted by a group of primarily women, healthcare providers and scientists, who were taking care of children who were orphaned at the end of World War I. So these were, so this was in the early 1900s, and um, they were taking care of orphaned children in post-war Vienna, and they made the really astute observation that when those kids had cod liver oil, they didn't have rickets, or when these kids went outside and got sunshine, they didn't have rickets, and so. Nobody knew what was actually the active ingredient in the sunshine or the, the cod liver oil, but that was, that was sort of the first step. And I can give you some really interesting history points along the way. I don't actually have it memorized, but I know I want to keep within time. So fast forward a number of years, um, and scientists learned more about fat-soluble vi fat vitamins, of which vitamin D is one, and um, learned how vitamin D worked. So when we're talking about vitamin D, we, we call it a vitamin, but in essence, it's more of a hormone. 
It has a slightly different function than, than other vitamins. And if you, <clears throat> excuse me, look at the far, far, far left here screen, you can see that it's got four ring structure, which is basically a um, cholesterol base. So it's, ba so it's, it's, it's a structure is based off of cholesterol. And what we've learned over time is that vitamin D is a really neat thing. Your body can make vitamin D if it's exposed to sunlight, particularly the UVB light. And also you can get vitamin D through dietary intake. And there's a sort of complicated pathway mechanism that involves both the liver and the kidney. And for the students in the audience, you're gonna be tested on this later, so, <laughs> so make good notes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so so the, um, the vitamin D that we either take in through the sun or through, through our diet is converted through the liver, then through the kidney to its actual um, active form, which is down at the bottom of the screen. And so um, these, are, these findings and discoveries were all made over the period of 50 years or so. Uh, I mentioned that a lot of the sources are, I kind of hinted at it already, but this is a nice graphical representation, a pictorial representation of the, the sources of vitamin D, which includes things like fatty fish, eggs, dairy, um, some mushrooms, down the bottom vitamin D capsules, and of course the sun. Um, sun is a little more challenging because there is potentially a risk for skin cancer, and so we've all been advised slather up, cover your skin so you don't get skin cancer, but that does in some ways cut down on our um, ability to generate our own vitamin D. So many of us rely on food sources and supplements. Um, and just for completeness sake, um, there is a recommended daily amount of vitamin D intake that's necessary for general health. I have it shown on the slide here. Um, for those of you in the audience who are 70 and older, it's 800 units a day. For those of you younger, 600 units a day. And for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, it's 600 units a day. So, so how do we put that together with what we are seeing in practice? This is the usual recommended amount that is suggested by the Institute of Medicine. But how many of you have encountered doses of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 or more. Yeah, so that's kind of where we are. So fast forward from the rickets in the early you know, 1900s, the late 1800s, to about 10 years ago, and vitamin D was supposed to be this miracle cure, right? There's vitamin D receptors in so many different organs of our body. They're in the kidney, they're in the GI tract. They, they must be good for us. So we should take more, right? This is, a, I think, a story of more is better more is better, it's probably not harmful and it's probably going to be better. So I think, you know, I remember going to my provider about this time that you should take at least 2,000 units a day of vitamin D, so I did for a while. But, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to keep up with that kind of stuff, so I will admit in front of everybody that I'm not 100% adherent to my prescribed regimen. <laughs> But so when we got here by, you know, 10 years ago, it must be good, it's the miracle cure, let's everybody take it, take big doses of it, it's gonna be good for you. Um, what were we taking it for? A lot of different things. Bone health, cancer prevention, heart disease prevention, mental health like depression, autoimmune disorders, it's been studied for asthma, for inflammatory bowel disease, for multiple sclerosis. So these are, kind of the wide variety of uses that people have attributed beneficial effects. Um, I would like to point out, though, that not all the studies have supported it conclusively that these are all beneficial effects. Um, but I really wanted to focus today on the fall piece. So whatever reason you were taking vitamin D, I want you to kind of take some of those things out of your mind, and we're just going to focus on the falling today, falls. So as Dr. Gray mentioned in her introductory comments, falling is a pretty serious health concern. Um, there's some information on the slide with you about, you know, it's, it's related to injury. It is a tremendous public health concern. Um, and it's preventable. So cool. Take some vitamin D, prevent falling. It's a win for everybody. And, you know, back in 2010, that was a pretty, pretty solid, you know, conclusion. 
And part of the reason that we were doing that is there were some studies done that were kind of um, filtered through the U.S. Preventative Task Force. I think I got that wrong. USPS, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. That's a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the task force. Um, and what the task force did is it was a group of researchers who compiled studies looking at falling in older adults. And this is focused primarily on the vitamin D association with falling. And so I'm not going to go too deep into detail, but I will point out that the dividing line in the middle, the number of the line that's labeled one, is a line that means if, if any of the diamonds is on that line or the line that is connecting to the diamond, if it crosses that line of one, there's no difference. So what you can see on this slide is there were a handful of studies, and in general, the diamonds all fall to the left of that line of one, which implies that these age, vitamin D is beneficial in preventing falls. So we felt good and we said, yes, let's take vitamin D. It's going to prevent falls. And that's kind of where we were in 2010. Jump ahead to 2017, 2018, the task force did a new study, and they looked at all of the studies that had been conducted up to the time of the last task force and new studies. And they did a similar analysis, and they looked at falling, again, related to vitamin D. And again, just to orient you, the line down the middle means no difference. You'll notice in this analysis that the diamond, the big diamond, the pooling of all the studies is exactly on that line, which means there's really no difference, which we would interpret as it, taking vitamin D does not de decrease our risk for falling. So you heard the headlines, right? Oh my gosh, you know, the vitamin D has fallen from grace. Vitamin D takes a tumble. Those are some of the headlines I saw. <laughs> vitamin D, yeah, kind of, kind of bad form, but yes, those are some of the headlines I saw. Um, so the, the most current recommendations in a nice cartoon graphical form are that for people who live in the community who are 65 and older, who don't have osteoporosis and don't have vitamin D deficiency, that's a mouthful, so we'll go over that a couple more times. Those are the people these recommendations are intended for. So that excludes people who live in an institutionalized setting, that excludes people who have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, that excludes people who have documented vitamin D deficiency. So the recommendations are, and this won't be any surprise, Dr. Firebaugh talked about the benefits of exercise, but the benefits of exercise are well established in reducing risk for fall also. Um, and the, um, what I'd like to point out here is that for vitamin D, in 2010 that was a B recommendation. Pretty good, good, good evidence, we should do it. It has been downgraded to D. So that means that we shouldn't be giving vitamin D to prevent falls any longer. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to reiterate, if you are over 65, you are living in the community, you do not have osteoporosis, and you don't have documented vitamin D deficiency, these recommendations apply to you. If you're outside of these characteristics, then we'll have to talk separately. Okay? So there's a very, very narrow set of criteria for people who for whom these, these recommendations are um, uh, suggested. So that would leave you with, well, nobody wants to fall. Is there something that I can do to prevent falling for either myself, for my loved ones, my family members? And I think I already hinted at it, and that is the best thing that we have evidence to, to, um, to recommend is exercise. And like Dr. Firebaugh said, it doesn't have to be marathon, it doesn't have to be triathlon, it doesn't have to be super cardio, spin class. Although if you're able to do those and you want to do those, I certainly would encourage you to do that. But you, it doesn't have to be that complicated. And in fact, there have been a few studies recently of even looking at something simple, gentle, like Tai Chi. 
that can help reduce increase balance, reduce risk of falls. So any kind of exercise um, is beneficial in reducing your risk for falling. The C grade for multifactorial interventions um, are sort of an it depends. So these fall in the gray zone, and these are very specific toward a particular person. So this would be recommending physical therapy if necessary. Um, having your medications reviewed to reduce the number and, and amount of medications that could increase your risk for falling. So that one you would have to talk to your provider to get a more detailed assessment so they can recommend the best street treatment strategy for you. So what else can you do to prevent falls? Well, we do know that falling is a risk factor for a subsequent fall. So if you have fallen or you're afraid of falling, tell your provider. Tell your provider. That should set up a list of questions that can spur a further conversation to determine what potential risk factors you might have to, um, to prevent additional falling. Uh, we know that medications are associated with falling risk. So talk to your pharmacist, talk to your provider about if there are any medications that you can either reduce the dose of or come off completely to reduce your risk for falling. And as I mentioned before, if in, within this um, uh, detailed assessment, you may have some additional, your, your provider may um, uh, have some additional recommendations for you. So. I would like to also put in a plug for pharmacists. These are a couple of logos um, that know your medicine, know your pharmacist. Don't be afraid to ask questions of your provider. Um, I work with primarily older adults who are 85 and older, and they tell me, I trust my doctor, I respect my doctor, I don't want to ask questions, I don't want to tell them what to do, I, you know, I don't want to cross that boundary. And so what I suggest to them is if you're worried you might be telling your doctor what, what you want to do, just ask a question. That way you're not telling, that way you're starting a dialogue, and you can kind of come up with a shared decision making and a plan that's just right for you. So don't be afraid to ask, do I still need to be on this medicine? Can, it, what's a good exercise regimen for me? So I will put in a plug for pharmacists, but also a plug for you to advocate for yourself so that you can um, make good choices for your health and hopefully prevent falls. And with that, I'm not sure how I did on time, but I appreciate your attention. I will be around to answer additional questions, and um, and I'd like to maybe propose that we all stand up and stop being sedentary. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate your attention. Are we going to take a couple of questions? We have any questions? Yeah, we have time for one question. Just one second so everyone can hear the question. Um, it's not exactly your lecture, but have there been other benefits of vitamin D that have recently been affirmed or debunked that you could just quickly list? Ooh, that's a tough task because it's been studied for so many different things. I was reading recently about asthma and multiple sclerosis, and, and quite honestly, I didn't do a deep dive into those because for today's lecture, I was focused primarily on falls. I would say that it has a really established benefit in osteoporosis and vitamin D deficiency, absolutely definitively. Great. Well, all the speakers did say that they'll be around if you have more questions. Um, so at this point, we'd like everyone to step out to the um, lobby area where we have some refreshments and snacks and actually some additional information on uh, marijuana use in particular. And thank you again for coming. We're really happy to see you all.